Welcome. Now, let's ask another question. Can information security governance be before stage four? And there are some considerations, and let, let's take a look in, a, in slightly more detail. Let's have a look at the security transformation model once again. Now, this is the information security transformation model, um, a tried and tested model uh, for an, a market which has a low security posture, and uh, it is the most reliable model an accurate model for such a market in order to bring about a true deep and lasting security transformation. Now, the implications of implementing stage four or security governance before the first three stages in the model, which is a sequential model, would be expending project energy, resources, and time, which are all limited, in governance, whereas they should have been spent on building the fundamental security foundation, which would later require management, or the need of management would arise later because we, are, we would be building the foundations, which is the first three stages first. Now, the implication of implementing stage four before the first three stages is also that we would be getting caught up in intangible governance activity. Now, intangible really means that it's not tangible, means, which would mean that there's no clear outcome. What is to be achieved? How are we going to achieve it? You can't go out and touch a router. Um, you know, it's, it, a, a server you can go out and touch if it's security hardened. It's a tangible activity. You can tell if the router has been hardened or not because you can do an audit. But for governance, there's sometimes uh, difficulty in understanding what is the activity, how are we going to measure it, when, how is it going to be performed? Who is going to, uh, you know, and, and the, the staff doesn't fully understand the concept of IT governance. So we would also risk getting caught up in policy and management without essential and funda fundamental underlying security controls. So without the controls in the foundation, which build up the foundation, we're actually talking about policy and managing, whereas the, the fundamentals are completely absent. Now, we would also be setting unrealistic expectations because usually what happens is that when policies are formed at a high level, uh, the security manager or the CISO are very ambitious and uh, they may be aggressive and they set a policy which is so tough um, or it's a mismatch for the posture of the current, current posture of the organization and there's no clear roadmap how it how it's will actually be, be implemented. So they may suggest very, very stringent controls which don't even match with the current capability of the organization. And that's what, what we mean when we say that you would be setting unrealistic expectations because it's set out as a constitution, but then you know, we're at this level, we need to go to that level, and how are we going to bridge the gap between the current posture of security and the policy? Uh, there's a big gap in, in, in that. So you may note that governance consists of documentation and process, a lot of documentation and process, which tends to bog down and slow down and disinterest uh, technical resources because they, they're not mentally tuned to understand what actually governance means. And, and many of these technical resources are not good at or not, have not been trained to write SOPs and policies and checklists and, and they haven't. And, and in any case, in Pakistan, we're not trained uh, culturally to work in a process environment. So security control stage one to three, once they are implemented by following security hardening and vulnerability management, international best practices can be better documented and regulated through governance. So what we're actually saying here is on this slide that once you've, you know, so initially you set a high level policy and say, and, and it's a simple, very brief policy, and then you go right down into the trenches, implement the controls, do the security hardening, do the vulnerability management, and then you start documenting uh, the SOPs, and you know what controls are possible because you've already applied them, and you know what controls are not possible because you tried them in the test environment and, and they wouldn't work, or they were causing some failure in your production system, um, in, your, in your application. So then you would try to um, you know, not play, either not place them in the policy or you would um, place some workaround or compensating control rather than, you know, for example, saying that we will have two-factor authentication in the policy 
And when you try to actually implement it, you find out that there's no budget or that uh, that application will actually not work uh, very well with two-factor authentication. And then you're violating your policy already because you made the policy, you went implement, tried to implement the control later, and uh, you couldn't do it. So now you're vi in violation of the policy. So the bottom-up approach is that you implement, you, you, you know, first you have a very thin, uh, light policy at the top. Then you go to the trenches, you, you implement the controls as per international best practices, you know what works, and, um, and then you incorporate those controls into the SOPs and eventually they go into the policy. Why is that? We know what works and is implementable in terms of security controls, like I just mentioned. Controls are implemented incrementally, and, uh, and this is more practical because you implement the benchmarks, it takes a lot of time and effort and hard work, and we don't have any unrealistic expectations. Um, and then minimal policy in place at the initial stages is obviously going to be there as, a, as the starting point right in the beginning. However, certain projects may have governance stipulations by regulators or customers. There may be deadlines to achieve certain governance or security milestones. In such cases, tailor the security transformation project because there's al always going to be unique cases uh, out there. So the sequence of the security transformation model stages one through four should be followed um, wherever possible strictly as it is a tried and tested model. However, the security transformation model may be tailored as per your unique requirements um, from time to time or as per your unique project. That's all that we have for this module. Thank you.